Cleveland Frontiers. And as you can see on our screen, we do have Gemma. And it is so nice to see everyone's faces. I recognize so many of you. Um, anyway, just a quick reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording 24 to 48 hours. Also, um, the TWI and Kata Summit, both coming up in March, and Gemma will be there as well. And if you guys do have any questions, you can email me, um, or you can send them in through chat here on Zoom. With that, Gemma, you go ahead. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you can you all see my screen now? Yes, we can. Awesome. That other question that we all now know. Um, wonderful. I'm just going to get it so I can see you as well. Brilliant. Okay. So thank you so much for Lean Frontiers for asking me to do this webinar. I'm super thrilled to be here. I'm very excited to see so many friends in the room. I can see loads of people I know, which is really wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about how to see and hear scientific thinking. And before I get into that, I'm going to do a quick intro. So I studied engineering at university and then I spent a long time in manufacturing where I fell in love with continuous improvement. And for all that time, I was really passionate about lean thinking. And I've also always enjoyed doing what I now know to be visual facilitation, using pens, paper, drawings to engage and facilitate. And I'm also a big fan of experiential learning, so people learning by doing and by reflecting on their experience. And in 2020, when the pandemic started, I trained to be a Toyota Kata coach and found this to be the missing piece of my practice. And ever since then, I've spent most of my waking hours um, focused on being a better learner and a better coach. And some of you might know, I, along with the wonderful Tracy <laughs> Rousseau, uh, sorry, some of you might know, along with Tracy Defoe, I founded the Category Geeks, a fabulous global learning community of women. And in all of what I do, the thing that I love the most is seeing the light bulbs switch on in people's heads. When they solve a problem, when they realize they've got the power to change something, when they see progress and learning towards their challenge. So that's me. So, so why this webinar? So if you're a Kata coach, you will know that the purpose of the coach is to teach the learner to think and act scientifically. And I have found myself whilst coaching learners, they are thinking, thinking that they are thinking more scientifically. This is wonderful, but this has come from an instinct. So I'm interested in how do we know? How do we as coaches be more scientific about the way that we teach and we coach? So this is something I was thinking about. And then when Lean Frontiers asked me to do a webinar in the run up to Catacon 8, I knew this was the place to talk about it. So this subject also links in nicely to Catacon 8 in March. You might know that myself and two other of the Catagirl geeks, Susan and Julie, will be doing 10 live coaching cycles over the two days of the conference. So if you're there, you'll be able to observe Susan working towards a two day challenge through the 10 coaching cycles. You'll see me coaching her to think and act more scientifically, and you'll see Julie coaching me to be a better coach and teacher. So I wanted to create something you could use as an observer to help you see and hear scientific thinking. So I set myself a challenge. Wouldn't it be wonderful if by the 19th of January today, I have created and shared a simple, useful and thorough starter kata to enable coaches, second coaches and observers to identify, understand and record how scientifically a learner is thinking and acting. And by the end of this session today, hopefully I should know if I've been successful in my challenge. So my first step was to go and ask some of my friends some people who are experienced Kata coaches. I interviewed each of these wonderful people and they generously let me peek into their brains and ask never ending questions. What are you looking for? How do you know? 
And particular thanks need to go to Julie and Mark over there on the left, who were super generous with their time and humoured me with all of my questions at random times of day. I, so I, I, I did all this work, I did this research, I interviewed these people and I asked all these questions and I had pages and pages of notes with many different things to look for and many ways to look for them. And there were some similar threads, but I didn't know how to bring it all together. Honestly, I was a bit overwhelmed. And that's where another person came in. So this is my son, this is Harrison, my son. This photo is from when he was two. Um, he's now nearly 16, so he's not quite as cute as that anymore. But he is a self-proclaimed science geek. He's mad about physics. He thinks incredibly logically. So I got him to come for a walk with me. I told him my dilemma, all about my overwhelm. How do I turn this into something useful? And he immediately said, mum, being scientific means based in evidence, finding and learning new things in a systematic and repeatable way. So maybe you should look up the definition of scientific mum, you know, with a big eye roll. Um, okay, thanks, teenager. So I ran home, I did some Googling, I did a bit more reading. And I found this definition, which really helped me. So it says that science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world, following a systematic methodology based in evidence. And that simple definition really helped me with some clarity. So I took all of my notes and all of those, those things that I'd recorded from interviewing all these people, and I distilled it into six key elements that I believe indicate scientific thinking. So first of all, are they curious? Are they motivated to learn? Second of all, are they methodical? Are they working in a methodical way? Do they have a systematic approach? Third, are they basing their thinking on evidence? Are they clear and focused? Are they formulating strong hypotheses? Sorry, are they being specific in their language? Are they being clear and focused? Fifth, are they formulating strong hypotheses? Are they building testable and falsifiable um, critique? And lastly, are they actually learning? Are they building new knowledge? So I had these six key elements of what I believe indicate scientific thinking. Now, I admit, I thought originally I predicted I would have five key points. That seemed like a good number to me. But every time I tried to remove one of these, it felt lacking. I played with a sequence until it made logical sense. And I desperately tried to come up with a clever acronym. But I felt that the integrity of the words and the sequence were more important. So I put each of these key points into a one page form that a coach, a second coach or an observer could use as a prompt, as a record, as a starter cutter. Five of those six points contain images and words describing the two ends of a scale. So you see those horizontal, thin horizontal lines with little vertical um, crosses. That's a scale for someone to mark the two, where, they, where they fit on that scale. Two of them contain prompts with tick boxes um, to, to allow the user to easily identify particular elements. And there's space as well for observation and notes. So now I'm gonna talk you briefly through each of those six elements and show you it up close. So first up is, are they curious? I put this first because even if this is the very first coaching cycle, or even if the coaching has not started yet, this is something you should be able to see and hear. They don't need to be necessarily actively doing the experiments yet, or even actively doing assessing their current condition. Just listening to them talk about their challenge should give us an indication if they are curious. So the key things I think we can look and listen for are, are they interested and excited? Are they using positive language? Are they energetic and engaged? We can look for signs of open body language. Now we could do a whole talk just on body language, 
but a few key things to look for might be their face. Are they facing the coach directly? Are they maintaining eye contact? What are they doing with their hands? Um, a sign of openness is showing your palms. If they have their hands hidden or they're curled in a fist or if they're in their pockets, that might be something to show that they're not so open minded. A big one to watch for, especially if you're if they're coaching via Zoom, if they cover their mouth with their hands, they could be holding something back. Now, note none of these are definite signs and context should be taken into account. We could also listen for signs that they are open minded, that they're open to discovering something new. So some examples of these points might be, and I'm showing some extremes here and I've simplified the language. But if you hear things like, well, my boss says I have to, or I'm not sure what's going to happen, or, well, this is never going to work, or the worst one, the meh. None of those things sound very curious. But if you hear, I really want to know if, or I wonder what will happen if, or I don't know, but I want to find out, especially if said with feeling and energy, that's a really great sign of curiosity. Now, of course, here we must think about context and remember that someone might just be tired, not bored. They might have had a terrible day or bad news, they won't always be jumping for joy. Some people might actually just be very reserved and hold in their feelings, so it might be harder to see. If you're that person's coach, you will start to learn that person's tells, their signals, the things they do when they're thinking deeply or when they're excited or when they're curious. None of these particular indicators are definitive. We're using them as guidance. So the key question here is, are they motivated to learn? And the scale on my starter cutter for this element runs from indifferent on the left through to curious on the right. Notice it's a seven point scale. So I'm trying to encourage the user not just to put the midpoint, although they could just do a pencil mark in the middle. And I've given some key points at both ends to help and left space in the center for notes and observations. So the first point is, are they curious? Are they motivated to learn? The second element is, are they working in a methodical way? So the key thing I'm looking for here are the logical links back through the storyboard. So does the challenge link to the vision? Does the target condition link to the challenge? Does the current condition link to the target condition? And so on, all the way through the storyboard, right up to the learnings from the last step. Do they link to what actually happened? And this is like a golden thread connecting through all of these elements and shows that the learner is thinking and acting in a methodical, logical way. Other things to listen for, they might say things like, this data shows me that. They might use the word therefore. I don't know if Tilo's here, that's his favorite word, I think. So here they're showing their steps, their logic. They're showing that they're connecting data and facts to conclusions. Another thing to listen for is whether they're answering the coach's questions directly without jumping forwards or jumping backwards. If their answers are all over the place or if they're roaming around the storyboard, this might indicate that they're not being so methodical. So an example here, let's imagine the coach has asked the learner about their obstacles. If they answer with, well, the problem is I don't have a standard procedure, so I'll create one and that will help. We can see there they've jumped forwards. They're talking about a solution, a next step, and also an expectation. They've not answered the actual question the coach has asked. Instead, if they asked, answered with a true obstacle, that's then an indication that they are being methodical. Okay, so the key question here is, do they have a systematic approach? And the scale here on my starter cutter form for this element runs from chaotic on the left to methodical 
on the right. And again, I've given some keywords at both ends to help. And I've also included a visual of those links across the storyboard with tick boxes. So the key element here is, are they methodical? Do they have a systematic approach? And the third element, so this is about whether their thinking is evidence-based. So we're looking for clear and up-to-date data on the, on the storyboard. We can listen to see if the learner refers to relevant data and metrics and facts. And we can also listen to see if the learner notices their own assumptions, notices their threshold of knowledge. I had this with a learner recently who all of a sudden could see when they were making an assumption. And it was like a light had gone in, on in their head. OK, so an example, if the coach asks what actually happened, if the learner says, so I went for a run and I'm pretty sure I was faster than last time. This is based on opinion. It's not based on evidence. There's no true data in that answer. Alternatively, if they answer, well, I ran this far and it took me this long and my speed was this. Then we can see that they're basing their thinking on evidence and facts. So the key question here is, are they focused on facts and data? And the scale here runs from opinion based on one end to evidence based at the other. And again, I've given some keywords to help the user at both ends. So the key here is, are they evidence-based and are they focused on facts and data? So the fourth of my six points is, are they being specific? Are they clear and focused? And I'm looking for here, I'm looking for precise, detailed descriptions and explanations. And I'm looking for this all over the storyboard, in their challenge statement, in their target condition, in their obstacle list, in each aspect of their experimenting record. If it's a next step and an experiment, is it repeatable? Have they given enough detail so that someone else could read it and do it? There is a great fun YouTube video all about making instructions clear and repeatable where the dad asks um, his kids to write instructions. Um, for making a sandwich and it's hilarious but it makes a great point and this tiny url takes you straight to that video if you haven't seen it now saying all of that that we want there to be lots of detail we want it to be repeatable we want it to be um, precise we also want the answers to be short and succinct i like to ask my learners to imagine they're tweeting what they're saying if that's relevant to them not that i count the characters but it makes us think about the words we use and forces them to be more specific. So an example here, if, if the coach has asked what the next, what is the next step? If the learner answers with lots of irrelevant, vague details, maybe I'll try, I hope, that, that's an indication that they're not being specific. Or if they answer with clear detail and a repeatable step, then that's definitely being more specific. So the key question here is, are they clear and focused? The scale on my starter kata runs from ambiguous on the left through to specific on the right, with keywords at each end to help. So are they being specific? Are they being clear and focused? So the fifth element here is slightly different. We're checking to see if we can see evidence that they are hypothesis driven. <clears throat> are their statements truly testable and falsifiable? Can their statements be proved right and proved wrong? And this is not just about their expectations for the next step. There's actually hypotheses all across the storyboard. So their challenge should be a hypothesis something we want to do, which we believe or expect to give us a particular outcome. The target condition is, an, is, a, uh, is a hypothesis. If things work this way, we believe we will get these results. 
The obstacles are hypotheses. We believe these things are preventing us from reaching this element of our target condition. And of course, what do I expect from my next experiment is a hypothesis, what I think will happen. To be a strong hypothesis, each of these should be testable. The learner should be able to prove it to be true. They should be able to use observation and measurement to confirm it. And it should also be falsifiable. The learner should be able to prove it wrong. And if it cannot be proven correct or incorrect by an experiment, then it's not scientific, not truly scientific. So we can listen to them and see if they explain how they will know. An example, so when describing the challenge, no one, if this, if this were the answer, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were number one marketing firm? No one can truly know if they're number one. Number one in the world, in the town, this year, this century, according to what and according to who. However, if they include dates, metrics and specific detail, then this can become a hypothesis. When explaining what they expect to happen, if they're vague and unspecific, this isn't a strong hypothesis. How will they know if something matters? But again, if they're specific about measures and metrics, if they say no, no change in the speed, uh, the de defect level will remain the same. This is testable and falsifiable. So rather than a scale here, I've provided checkboxes for the coach or the observer to prompt them to look and listen for evidence of each of those things. The challenge, the target condition, the obstacles, and what do they expect? So the key here is, is this learner hypothesis driven? And the final element, the purpose of all that they are doing is, are they learning? Are they actually building new knowledge? So key points to look for here. First, and perhaps most importantly, do they acknowledge when they are wrong? Better still, do they acknowledge and accept when they are wrong? And even better, the sign of a real serious scientific thinker, do they also embrace when they are wrong? As a side note, if you'd like to try and follow a routine to help you embrace the times when you were wrong, you can go to this tiny URL. I'm just gonna put it in the chat. You can go to this tiny URL to, to a website with another starter cutter by Mike Rother, a one week routine to help you see the unexpected as positive. Okay, we can also listen for positive, a positive attitude to discoveries. We're keeping an eye out for body language and facial expressions perhaps here. We're also looking for energy and excitement. Also, do they have a thirst for new knowledge? Are they still curious? Which ties us nicely back to the first of the, of the six elements. Okay, as an example here about learning, if you hear a learner blaming someone or something else or being hesitant to accept, the word but is a, is a big red flag here, or refusing to accept something in front of them, that might show they're not learning. However, if they're humble and they're open to discoveries, if they're listening to their data and facts and making conclusions which are a surprise, then they are learning. So the key question here is, are they building new knowledge? And the scale on my starter cutter for this element runs from ignorant at one end to learning on the right. And again, there's keywords to help the, the user identify where the learner is on this scale. So these are the six elements that I believe we can look and listen for to help us understand better if a learner is thinking and acting scientifically. Are they curious? Are they methodical? Are they based in evidence? Are they specific, driven by hypothesis? And are they learning? And I listed, as I said, each of these on a form, a starter cutter, which someone could use to help them identify and record each element. 
In this version, you can see I've scribbled notes and quotes, used the scales, used the tick boxes, and notice in the very bottom right-hand corner, it says it's, this is version 1.2. So I'll be iterating and updating this as I play with it more. And I'd love for others to try it out. If you would like to, please download that sheet from my website on the resources page, and please let me know your feedback. So one final thing, I said I tried desperately to fit these steps into an acronym, but it just did not fit. And commercial is a really rubbish word. So instead, I thought I'd come up with a mnemonic to help remember the six steps. And I spent far too long on this, coming up with various different versions. I think the funniest was colossal messy elephant swindle Hungarian llamas. Uh, not very useful, but perhaps the most appropriate was concise, measurable expectations soon have learnings. So before I go, you might have heard me talk before about micro learnings. These are tiny bursts of new knowledge. If you've had any micro learnings today, please share them in the chat or on social media. I follow this hashtag on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I would love to see what you thought or your questions. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, that was, it was, it was good. I hope it was useful and I'd love to hear what people say. Thank you. Gemma, thank you so much for your presentation today. I loved it. I hope everybody else did too. It was awesome. It was so good to see your face as well and so good to see everybody else's that are here. Um, again, just a reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording 24 to 48 hours. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. Gemma, if you want to take a couple of questions, we can do that yeah. really fast um, since we do have just a few minutes left. Of course. Does anybody have any questions? I can see some comments in the chat. That's lovely. Thank you. I don't have any questions for you, Gemma, but I really enjoyed it. And I want to let you know that this has uh, given me a model to look inside of myself. Uh, to find out, you know, how good of a job I'm doing. I can see some things in here that are going to be very useful for me going forward, uh, you know, as I try to coach people. Um, I run into some of everything what you described. That's why I, I enjoyed it so much because it's very relative. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's really kind. Julie's got her hand up. Hey, Thank Julie. You. Hi, Gemma. Um, great job. I loved, I loved seeing this presentation, this webinar come together. Um, with the use of the form, would you recommend using it during a coaching cycle? So if you're a coach with a learner, would you have it right there? Or is it a reflective activity? So I think, I think it depends on, your, on the way you work with your learner. So I tend to write a lot of things down when I'm coaching. Um, so I might keep to my regular notes and then transfer things across to this sheet. Um, if I was an observer or a second coach, I think I would do it directly onto the mm -hmm. form. And that's what I've been doing, um, you know, over the last, over the past few weeks to practice. Um, so yeah, I think it would depend on how the, how the person works, but I've, I've kind of had it alongside my regular notes, the way, when I've been working this week, coaching someone, taking my regular notes, but then also sort of transferring things across. Great, thank you. I think it forms a nice part of a reflection as well to, yeah. to really go back and think about it deeply. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you again for your help. Always my pleasure. Okay, well, that is all I see. I don't see any more hands up or questions coming in. So everybody, thank you very much for joining us today. We will see you all very, well, very later. That's not real. We will see you all later. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.